Good morning, everybody. Hope you guys are having a fabulous week so far. I am. I'm on vacation this week. Uh, I'm loving being here with you each morning. Uh, today is going to be pretty intense. Um, yesterday was pretty funny. Make sure if you didn't go back, uh, if you haven't watched yesterday's, go back and watch it. It's about men and women and how they communicate differently. And you can share that with your friends or tag a man in your life and uh, let them watch it. I was getting some messages from men last night that watched it during the night. So your guys are watching it later. So just go ahead and tag them on that. Today we're continuing on this theme called worship. I just want to welcome you to the room. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, y'all just, uh, every morning, y'all are just dedicated. And I want to remind us what hashtag pray first means. It means that we're giving God the first of our day, the first of our week, the first of our month, the first of our year. When we wake up in the morning, before we reach for the phone, before we turn on the television, before we check our emails, our texts, our social media, we're giving God an offering, a sacrifice of our worship first thing in the morning. It's the first thing we do in the morning. It's the last thing we do at night because a lot of times the devil knows how to, um, to start your day and knows how to plan your agenda for the day based on the first few things you do in the morning. I see people get and say, today's already shot. Oh, it's the worst Monday ever. And I'm like, it's 6.30 a.m. It can't be the worst Monday ever. Come on, let's not be so uh, dramatic. So we want to jump right in. Get your Bibles out if you got those, your computers, your phone, uh, your U version, whatever you use. We're going to Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 1. And remember, please share this. Right now, some of you have the ability to click share and actually tag your friends immediately. And I know some of you guys have to wait till after uh, the broadcast. But whichever the case may be, go ahead and tag and share this, man. You guys are sharing and you are reaching literally hundreds and thousands of people. So I thank you for that. I want to ask you a question like I do every day. What is an idol? What is an idol? Very simple question. Uh, maybe you grew up in church or maybe you've watched movies or you just have a concept of what you think an idol is. Go ahead and type that in there. What do you think an idol is or what do you know? I don't want to presume. What do you know that an idol is? Come on, type them fingers. Get, get them fingers ready. I'm going to begin reading Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 1. And we're going to read several passages here, so just be patient and understand that God wants us to worship him, which means love expressed. He wants us to express his love to him. He wants us to talk to him. He wants us to communicate our love to him. Ezekiel 14, verse 1. We're going to talk about some things that will hinder your speaking to him. Idols in the heart will keep you from loving God to the extent that you could love God. Ezekiel 14, 1. Now, some of the elders, I want you to notice elders. The elders of Israel, not the elderly, but the they were like the Pharisees. They were the religious leaders of Israel. Now, some of the elders of Israel came to me and sat before me, and the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, these men have set up their idols in their hearts and put before me, remember we pray first, putting God first, and put before me them that which causes them to stumble. Okay, I'm going to read that again. Son of man, these men have come and set up their idols in their heart and put before them that which causes them to stumble into iniquity. Should I even let myself be inquired by them at all? Therefore speak to them and say to them, thus says the Lord God, every one of the house of Israel who sets up idols in his heart and puts before him that which causes him to stumble into iniquity and then comes to a prophet I will answer him who comes according to the multitude of his idols, that I may seize the house of Israel by their hearts. God is very concerned about our heart. He always has been. He always will be. Because they are all estranged. I want you to notice that word estranged from me by their idols. Therefore, say to the house of Israel, thus says the Lord God, repent and turn away from your idols and turn your faces away from all of your abominations. For any one of the house of Israel or the strangers who dwell in Israel, referring to a, a prophetically to the Gentiles, who separates himself from me, who separates himself from me, and sets up idols in his heart and puts before him that which causes him to stumble into iniquity, then comes to a prophet to acquire uh, inquire of him concerning me. I, the Lord, will answer him by myself. I will set my face against that man. I will make him a sign and a proverb. I will cut him off from the midst of my people. Then you shall know that I am the Lord, your God. 
And if the prophet is induced to speak anything, I, the Lord, have induced that prophet, and I will stretch out my hand against him and destroy him from among my people Israel, and they shall bear their iniquity. They shall bear their iniquity. The punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray. Let me explain why the punishment of the prophet is the same as the one who inquired. When someone is living in sin, and the prophet of God begins to condone their sin or give them a spiritual basis to continue in their sin, God says the iniquity that's on that person asking the question will now become your iniquity. And the reason for that is, is that prophet has inside of them. The reason that prophets, men of God, women of God uh, condone sin is because they have the same idol in their heart. And they shall bear the iniquity and punishment of the prophet shall be the same as the punishment of the one who inquired, that the house of Israel may no longer stray from me nor be profane me any more with all their transgressions, but that they may be my people and I may be their God. That's one of the most uh, repeated phrases in the whole Bible. God wants you to be his people and he wants to be your God. Why can't these elders who are coming before the prophet hear God for themselves? I mean, they're elders. They're the spiritual leaders in the com community in the group and yet they're going before God. They can't hear God for themselves because they've placed idols in their heart. They want people to think that they're holy and that they're righteous and that they're godly. They want people to think that they have no problems, but they have problems. Their problems are just hidden. They don't uh, engrave images and they don't have an idol on the mantle and they don't go up to the high places and worship. See, people would go up to the high places and worship idols. We'll talk about that in a, little, in, in a minute. Uh, so they didn't have these outward illusions that out in the garden was a little statue of a man or a statue of a woman that they would bow down and worship and you know take sacrifices to. They hid their idol, idols in their hearts, and they aren't going up to those places, and they're not worshiping idols openly, but they still have idols in their heart, and God says it's an abomination uh, to him. Let me ask you a question. Might you and I have idols in our hearts that's keeping us from loving God as fully as we could love God. Today we're going to talk about four deadly idols or the results of idols in our heart that are deadly to us. I'm going to get to that in just a minute. God has always been concerned about our hearts. I want you to say that with me, always. Type it out there. God has always been concerned about our hearts. Hit the little heart button. Anytime I say the word heart, just hit, the, hit that little heart button. God has always, I'm going to repeat that one more time, been concerned about our what? That's right. He's always been concerned about our hearts. Now, this is going to be shocking, but I want you to hear me and hear me clearly and let me finish the entire statement. And I also want you to think about Scripture to dispute what I'm about to say, especially if you church folks are out there. God has never, God has never been concerned with literal idols. God has never been concerned with an image of an idol. I'm going to say it in the way that you're going to really blow up now. God has never been concerned with graven images. Now, some of you are like, that's blasphemy, blasphemy, Doug. Doug, Doug, that's, I don't know where it is, but let me, let me, tell, you, let me tell you. I'll, I'll help you. I'll tell you where it is. It's the second commandment. Thou shalt not have graven images. Thou shalt not have any gods before me. But come here, come here, come here, come here, come here. God's concern was never with the image. God's concern was never with the idol. God is not afraid of your ceramic vase. God is not concerned with your wooden carving. God is not concerned with your stone sculpture. God is more concerned that you will bow and worship those images in your heart because God knows something about those images that many times you and I do not realize. Behind every image, behind every idol, there is a demon. So a demon, yeah, behind every idol, there's a demon. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 tells us that God's not concerned with images. God's not concerned with, with uh, rocks and stones and sticks and twigs. God knows that behind that thing that you're bowing down to, your money, your finances, that relationship, that addiction, whatever that may be, that you're bowing down to, behind the image you're looking at is a demon assigned to your life to kill, steal, and destroy from you. 1 Corinthians 10 verse 18 says, consider the people of Israel. Do not those who eat the sacrifices participate in the altar? Do I mean then that food sacrificed to an idol is anything? Or that an idol is anything? 
No, but the sacrifices of pagans are offered to demons, not God. Whew. So behind that image, behind that idol, behind that thing in your heart that keeps you from loving God like you could or expressing love like you could, it's not the pornographic image. It's the demon behind the pornographic image. It's not that money is the root of all evil. It's not the image of the money. It's the love of money that is the root of all evil. It's what we've set up in our hearts. We don't have them sitting on our mantles. We don't have them sitting in our yards. We carry our Bibles. We go to church just like those uh, prophets in Ezekiel chapter 14. They didn't go up to the high places. They went to the church. They carried their Bibles. You didn't know they were worshiping idols. They didn't have them hanging around their neck. They had their idols hidden in their hearts. Idols are nothing. It's demons behind the idol that has been assigned to you to kill, steal, and destroy. And very soon, I'm going to do something on angels and demons, um, a series on that. So I want you to be prepared for that. God has always, let's say this together, God has always been uh, concerned about our heart. Deuteronomy, even in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16, circumcise your hearts, therefore, and do not be stiff-necked any longer. This is Old Testament. This is before the New Covenant. Covenant. This is when God was so adamant about the physical surgery of circumcision on a male child. He says, listen, the point of this is it's an image. It's a representation. There's something behind that. What's behind that is, is that I want you to circumcise your heart. The New Testament version of that would be Romans chapter 2, verse 29. No, a person is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit, not by the written code. Woo! Let me say that again. Circumcision is circumcision of the heart by the spirit. So he's saying, it's not this physical thing you're doing. It's something spiritual inside of you that when you receive Jesus, because listen, circumcision was always uh, uh, pointing towards it was a representation of the salvation when Jesus would take our heart and cut the flesh off of it. Cut the flesh off of it so that we could love him. Let's get started on the four things. I'm going to give you two today and two tomorrow. Four things that an idol in your heart will cause. Four things that an idol will cause in your heart. One more time. Four things. I'm going to give you two today. Four things that an idol will cause in your heart. Number one, if you have idols in your heart or an idol in your heart, it will cause spiritual deception. Spiritual deception. Now, this is probably a deeper teaching than we've done in these mornings, and I know it's 7 a.m., uh, so please go back and watch this again. Please go back and, and read it again. Look up these scriptures. Spiritual deception is when you are so deceived spiritually that you begin to think what you're doing is okay, and you'll begin to justify it. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 3, Son of man, these men have set up idols in their heart and placed before them that which causes them to stumble. In other words, here's what spiritual deception is. When we began to cater to the idol, when we begin to set things before them, when we begin to premeditate our sin, and we begin to plan our sin, we begin to plan it, meditate on it, follow through with sin, that's called sinning presumptuously. That's called sinning presumptuously. We're not making a mistake. We made a plan to do this. We're not mistaking. We're planning to do it. For example, if your idol in your heart is pornography, you plan alone time. You plan to hide. You plan where you're going to be and how you're going to do it. And then you plan the cover-up through deleting that stuff so that you won't get caught and you don't want it to be known. Listen, you're not... You're not you're not stumbling into pornography. You are sinning presumptuously. And there's many. That's just one that I'm picking out when we plan our sins. Romans chapter 13, verse 14 says this. But put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. This is presuming on God's grace. I, I'll just ask forgiveness later, and I will be fine. We know it's wrong, 
but we do it anyway. Spiritual deception comes when we have idols in our heart. Number two, spiritual adultery comes when we have idols in our heart. Ezekiel chapter 14, verse 5. That I may seize the house of Israel by their what? By their heart, because they are all estranged from me by their idols. The word estranged is what I want you to see there. And here's a little Bible study for you. The New Living Bible in the NIV is what's known as dynamic equivalency Bibles. In other words, they translate the thought. The New American Standard, the New King James, the King James are what's called exact equivalency translations, and they translate the exact word. The exact word here, the Hebrew word is estranged and is defined by a woman who is married, who has left her husband and is now living in adulterous relationship with another man. He's saying, the bride of Christ, my bride, has left my home and she is living with another man. When you have idols in your heart, it causes spiritual deception and spiritual adultery. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 6, the Lord said to me in those days of Josiah the king, have you seen what backsliding Israel has done? She has gone up. He refers to Israel as a she because it's his chosen people, the church being his bride. She has gone up on every high mountain where they built the altars to sacrifice and under every green tree, it's what they made the idols out of, and there she has played the harlot. Jeremiah chapter 3 verse 9. So it came to pass through her casual harlotry that she defiled the land and committed adultery with stones, another thing that they built the altar out of, and trees, which is what they carved the idols out of. She committed adultery with stones and trees. What does that mean? She didn't go up there and physically commit adultery with stones and trees. She committed adultery by leaving her first love, God, and worshiping at the feet of idols, bowing her heart, expressing her love, communicating with these idols. And God wasn't concerned about the idols. He was concerned about the demons behind the idols. Listen to me. We've got to wrap this up. Here's what sin is. Here's what idolatry is. Idolatry brings deception and it brings spiritual adultery. We are the bride of Christ. When we sin and we presumptuously plan sin, it's as if we go to bed with Jesus. Sometime during the night, we get this plan. We slip out of bed with Jesus we go and we sleep with a demon. This is pretty powerful stuff, isn't it? We sleep with a demon. That's what God says about idols. Then we come back home to inquire of the prophet. And we slide back in the bed with Jesus, hoping that he doesn't know where we've been or what we've done. Oh, but he's wide awake. He's fully aware of where we've been and what we've done. And he's got his back to us. And it's not because he's angry. It's because he's brokenhearted. You are his love. You are the love of his life. His greatest joy comes when you worship him and you express your heart, you express your worship. But when you have idols in your heart, you cannot love him like you could if you removed that spiritual deception and you got out of that spiritually adulterous relationship and you stay there with him. God's not angry with you. God is not angry with you. Uh, I believe it's in... I don't remember exactly where it is, but it's talking about in the days, I believe it's in Isaiah, in the days of Noah, I will not pour out my anger anymore. I will not be angry with them anymore. I have decided that in the new covenant under Jesus, I will not be angry with them anymore. He's not angry. He's hurt. Why is God not angry? Because he poured out all his wrath on Jesus Christ. We are sinning presumptuously on the grace of Jesus Christ. He's poured out all his wrath on Jesus Christ. And we're sinning by planning it. And then slipping back in and hoping he doesn't know where we've been and what we've done. And it breaks his heart. Sin breaks the heart of Christ because we are the bride of Christ. And he loves us so much. And sin kills, steals, and destroys. And he's come to give us life. And he wants you to have life. Let me pray for you. Father, right now in Jesus' name, I pray that we just take in whatever part that you've made scream out to us through your Holy Spirit this morning. That we would examine our heart that we would examine ourselves and see where are we and maybe do an inventory of our heart and find out what is it that we're worshiping and what is it that we're thinking and what is it we're expressing love to. God, this is not about condemnation. This is not beating us up. This is about taking inventory so that we can express love to you better and more freely. In Jesus' name, and all God's people said, amen. If you ain't scared, share this. Uh, this is not common teaching, especially for our morning pray firsts. But man, this is powerful, 
And so I want you to hit some likes, hit some hearts, hit some angry faces if you're upset. That's fine. But please share this. I want to ask you one more time whether you're watching this pre-recorded or you're watching this live. What do you think an idol is? What are some idols that come between you and maybe expressing your love to God? I love you guys. I went super duper over today. But this is a teaching that I need to get done. And tomorrow I'll come back with two more. I love you all so much. That's why I talk about this stuff. I want you to be as close to God as you can. That's why I live, to bring the two parties together like he's doing for me. And let me tell you, I've got plenty of it in my heart. So I'm taking inventory and I'm working on it constantly. This isn't something you just get over all of a sudden. I love y'all. Bye, guys.